Hello, it's John Breslin from NUI Galway. So in today's video we're going to look at microphones and um, many microphones are related to another fundamental type of electronic device which is called the capacitor. So so far we've looked at these elements of the mobile phone subsystem. We've looked at the charger which essentially takes an AC or alternating current um, type of voltage and converts it into a DC voltage that our mobile phone or many other types of electronic devices can make use of. We've looked at the circuit board which connects many of the subsystems in our mobile phone to each other and we've looked at the speaker in terms of um, producing um, some sounds that is communicated to the outside world and this is a form of actuator in that it's carrying out some kind of action um, that interfaces with the real world. So we're going to look now at the microphone component of the mobile phone. Now, of course, we've had phones for many years and the uh, phone shown on the right hand side here, a very old phone with a rotary dial, does share much of the same principles with the mobile phone that we use today. And I suppose the closest part is a microphone because they essentially work in, in the same way. A microphone is a form of acoustic to electric sensor. By that we mean we, we take an acoustic sound or a movement of um, molecules in the air from the outside world and we convert it into an electric signal that can be used by our mobile phone or by other types of devices. So essentially we convert that sound into an electrical signal where that signal is usually proportional to the sound produced in the outside world. Different varieties of microphones include condenser microphones, um, electric condensers, dynamic, carbon and so on. Now of course as well as the mobile phone itself we have to think about what's happening around the mobile phone and therefore it's not just a microphone we need to put in place but also there are other types of um, considerations. So for example you're holding your mobile phone and there's some wind blowing by your ear or blowing by the, um, the microphone of the phone. We've got um, external noise Then, of course people hold phones at varying distances from their mouth and when they're speaking so again we have to take that into account be able to um, appropriately vary the, um, the, the sound that we pick up or the electrical signal that represents that sound as the distance varies. And also in mobile phones the information is then eventually either transmitted to another phone or stored somehow using some digital format and that involves some kind of conversion from not just um, the acoustic signal to the electric signal but then the electric signal has to be converted to digital data and later on we're going to look at analog to digital conversion some of the advantages of doing this and so on so the condenser microphone or the capacitor microphone has a long history it was invented at bell labs we've seen and will see bell labs appearing a number of times uh, throughout this uh, course in 1916 so uh, well over a uh, hundred years ago and in the condenser microphone we have basically what's called a capacitor. A capacitor is a specific type of um, electrical or electronic device and it consists of two plates. And I'll explain in a little bit more detail exactly how the capacitor works. But for now imagine that there is um, two plates and one of those plates acts as the diaphragm or moving part of a microphone. And vibrations in the air will then produce um, a movement in this diaphragm which in turn produces a change in the distance between two plates. So imagine two plates operating in parallel to each other. The diaphragm is movable and audio signals would change, will cause changes or movements in that diaphragm that then in turn changes the distance between the two plates. And then a um, property of the capacitor is what's called capacitance. And capacitance is um, again, another term we'll define later on, but for now it's enough to know that it's related to the distance between the plates and therefore um, the voltage on the capacitor will then also change as well. So here's a little picture of how it works. You can see on the left hand side um, we have basically the capsule which holds the, um, the microphone and within that you can see two parallel um, plates there um, shown there. One is the diaphragm on top and then there's a back plate. So these are two parallel plates of a capacitive device. And then on the right hand side you can see two pictures basically reflecting the um, movement of air and that of course corresponding to some um, change in, in sound in the, in the outside world. And that movement or pressure fluctuation as it's referred to there either causes the diaphragm to move in 
or move out. Now, a property of a capacitor is that the voltage, written here um, in terms of another name, which is potential difference, is actually related to um, the value of capacitance. So as, for example, you can see here in the middle picture on the, um, on the right-hand side, as the, um, the pressure fluctuates in this direction, we have the diaphragm moving up in this direction here. And then basically this distance here is increasing and the capacitance will also increase. Um, uh, sorry, the capacitance will also decrease because the capacitance, as we see later on, is inversely proportional to distance. So as the distance grows between these two plates, the capacitance will decrease and that will result in a corresponding increase in voltage. And then over here on the second picture, you can see that the pressure fluctuation causes the diaphragm to move inwards. That, of course, is um, resulting in a smaller distance between the two plates. And as a result, again, since capacitance is going to be inversely proportional to distance, and again, I'll explain this in a bit more detail later on, C is proportional to 1 over D, then a decrease in distance results in an increase in capacitance. And that, in turn, will produce a decrease in voltage. We'll see the formula for this, for this later on. So we have um, basically this um, capacitive element and as pressure again uh, corresponding to sound in the air causes movement of this diaphragm that in turn will cause an electrical signal to come out from the output which is the voltage um, which is proportional to some change in this pressure disturbance. And then that goes through some other elements here. We won't explain these in detail but these are going in through some kind of amplifier and then the output signal is perhaps going to be transmitted or maybe it's going out to some other type of system like um, like some speakers and so on. So that's the essentials of the microphone. Now one variation on um, the capacitor microphone is what's called um, an electric microphone. An electric is essentially, if you, if you know how or you understand the principle of a magnet, basically being able to store magnetism, well, the electric is a corresponding device that stores electric charge and it's a permanently charged, like a magnet is a, is a permanently magnetized um, piece of metal. An electric is a permanently charged with electric charge um, piece of metal as well. And this is actually a patent from um, 1964 and again from our, our, our friends in, in Bell Telephone Labs, as it says there. And again, this is a very common type of microphone used in many devices today. So invented in 1962, actually the, the patent on the previous slide there, I'll just skip back, back to it for a second. Uh, you can see there just over the top, it says that it was invented in, in uh, 1964. But um, the, uh, sorry, it was patented in, in 1964. The invention itself was in 1962. So I mentioned that the um, element that powers the electric uh, condenser is the electric. This is the uh, metal or ferroelectric material that has been permanently charged. For a magnet we usually talk about some ferromagnetic material and um, in the electric we have this ferroelectric material that has been permanently charged. And that provi provides charge to the electric micro mic microphone rather than needing a battery. Um, some of the advantages it, uh, is that it gives very good performance at a low cost. And the vast majority of microphones today, whether they are in your mobile phone, in your PC, and so on, are made of electrodes. And of course, because we're all um, mobile phone users and smart mobile phone users are becoming more and more commonplace, there is a large amount of electrodes being produced. As you can see there at the bottom there, the estimated annual production is at over 1 billion units. So, I've talked about capacitor. Capacitor is one of the fundamental electronic, uh, electrical and electronic components. So we've got two different types of components in, in uh, electrical and electronic engineering, passive components and active components. Passive components usually um, don't um, need some kind of uh, um, power source to operate, but rather they work when they are included in some kind of system. Whereas an active component will not only require interaction with something else, but it also requires an external power source to, to, uh, to make it work. So some examples of active components are, um, for example, microchips. Microchips perform some kind of operation when they're put into a system, but they also require powering up to make them operate in the first place. Uh, the capacitor is composed of two plates separated by what's called a dielectric material. So we've got two parallel plates, 
and you can see the the um the symbol for the capacitor shown here on the right hand side two lines shown in parallel representing the two parallel plates now the picture at the bottom here shows a typical capacitor what you will note is that it doesn't look anything that would seem to indicate two plates in parallel but that's because in this particular structure the two plates are wound um around uh, the, the closest analogy i can think of is um a Swiss roll or um, a French Christmas log where basically you've got kind of um, two layers wrapped around and around in this kind of cylindrical shape here. You'll also see as well on the um, on the picture here that there's some minus sides or sorry minus signs along one side of the capacitor and actually the capacitor is connected into a circuit with a certain polarity so the plus pin is one that is not marked as a minus pin. The definition of capacitance, which, which is a measure attributed to a capacitor, is an ability to store electrical charge. And the higher the value of a capacitance you have, the more electrical charge you could store. So in equation form, capacitance is written as C is equal to Q over V. The capacitance, which is uh, represented by the quantity symbol C, is equal to charge, represented by the quantity symbol Q divided by voltage represented by the quantity um, uh, V. And if you were to write down the units for these, well then we have um, C, the unit for capacitance is farads, or F, and that's equal to um, Q, which is measured in coulombs, as it says there at the top, divided by volts, which is measured in volts. Okay, so that's the, the units for the above um, equation. Um, you can also see a note there that coulombs, there's a little star here, it says that one coulomb is equivalent to the charge of 6.24 by 10 to the power of 18 electrons. So one coulomb, say 1c, is going to be equal to 6.24 by 10 to the power of 18, and actually 10 to the power of 18 is written as exa. So you can think of uh, kilo, mega, giga and so on. When you get up to 10 power of 18 it's equal to exa. And that's either um, electrons or units of positive charge, whichever one you want to do. That's equal to one coulomb. So an example there at the bottom, a five volt battery would produce 110 micro coulombs of charge on a 22 microfarad capacitor. Okay, so let's say we have a 22 microfarad capacitor. We have basically a measure of how much charge a certain capacitor can hold. And we connect it up to five volts then we can calculate how much um, charge that will actually hold. So that'll be 110 microcoulombs. Okay, so 22 microfarads is equal to 110 microcoulombs divided by five volts. And of course you can then figure out, since we know that one coulomb is this many electrons, how many electrons does this correspond to? Okay, so you can calculate from 110 microcoulombs, well if you multiply 110 micro by 6.24 by 10 to the power of 18 electrons, you can calculate how many um, electrons that would correspond to as well. So here's some pictures of typical capacitors. You can see different shapes here, and because these are two different forms, we have ones that are meant for um, putting, for example, into um, breadboards or into what are called true hole circuits, shown here on the, um, on the right hand side. And then we have some flat or surface mount capacitors shown on the on the left hand side but again you can see and um, quite small these are measured in terms of, of um, centimeters so quite small components so we've seen the equation for the relationship between capacitance charge and voltage c is equal to q over v and we also said that a capacitor is um, represented in terms of its ability to store electric charge um, and uh, we can also write down an expression for how much energy can actually be stored in a capacitor due to an electric field. So what happens is, and we'll explain this again in a little bit more detail, is that on the two plates, we basically have a buildup of electric charge um, on the two plates. So like for example, in this picture here, where you can see um, the two plates shown for a capacitor, what we'll have is we'll, we'll have a buildup of charge on one plate, negative charge on one plate, and positive charge on the other plate. And when that happens, it creates a magnetic field in the area here, which is color blue, and that, uh, sorry, it creates an electric field um, in that area there uh, shown in blue and the effect of that electric field is that energy um, can be stored in the capacitor between the two plates. The amount of energy then is represented by this formula here. W is equal to a half CV squared. 
So we have um, basically a relationship between the amount of energy, which is um, proportional to the capacitance, and then it's proportional to the square of the voltage applied to the capacitor as well. So here's a picture of um, a very basic capacitive structure where we've got two rectangular plates separated by a material called the dielectric. And these, these plates are typically some kind of uh, conductive material like, like a metal. And then we have our um, dielectric material in the middle, which doesn't allow um, conduction of, uh, of, of, of charge typically from, from one side to the other. And then the, the amount of capacitance is related by this formula here. 8.85 picofarads divided by m, so this is picofarads per meter, multiplied by epsilon times a divided by d. So these variables uh, refer to the quantity shown down here. 8.85 picofarads per meter is just um, a value with epsilon, which is the relative dielectric constant of the material between the plates. And this relative dielectric constant is uh, comes about because it's combined with this, which is the um, dielectric constant of uh, of a vacuum, and basically the two of these combine together. The relative plus the it's relative to to the uh, what we call epsilon zero dielectric for a vacuum, um, and it's measured in uh, picofarads per meter, because if you look at the various variables in here, we have picofarads per meter, we have meter squared, and we've meter again, and when you combine all those meters, they leave you with just a value in in farads, which is the measure of capacitance. So 8.85 picofarads per meter epsilon times A, which is the area of one of the plates, divided by D, which is the distance between the two plates. So these distance between plates, A is the area of the plate, and epsilon, as I mentioned, is the relative dielectric constant of the material between the plates. And depending on what kind of material in here, you'll have different values of, um, of epsilon. So here's an exercise. If we have the formula on the previous slide, and we want to try and find the capacitance for a particular type of structure, let's go and work through this example and, and, and see what, what, what it turns out to be. So, first of all, we have our formula, which is um, C is equal to 8.85 by uh, I said it was picofarads. Pico is 10 to the power of minus 12 farads per meter times epsilon, which is our relative dielectric constant. Sometimes you see this rep written as epsilon or subscript or times A over D. Okay, so that's our starting formula. So we're told we have a um, we we have a capacitance of um, we would find the capacitance for a 2.0 centimeter diameter capacitor in a condenser microphone. Okay, so imagine the microphones we saw earlier on with basically kind of a, a, um, a circular structure like so. And we have a 2.0 centimeter diameter for this structure, okay? So the diameter is 2.0 from side to side. And we're also told that the plates are separated by a distance of 0.25 millimeters. And then we're also told that the dielectric constant, which is our epsilon, is 8.0. So using this, we can then calculate the various parts here. We can calculate A, for example, to start off with. We have A is going to be equal to pi r squared. And that, of course, is 3.14159265358979323246264233. Multiply by r squared, which is 0 0.01 in terms of meters. We're told that the um, the size is 2.0 centimeters, which is um, 0 0.01 meters. Okay, so one centimeter is 0 0.01 meters, and that's squared. And that works out to be 0 0.314 by 10 to the power of minus 3 meters squared. Okay, so that's A. And then we can insert all of that into our formula because we have epsilon is 8. A is 0.314 by 10 to the power of minus 3. And D, we're told, is 0.25 millimeters. So we can write out our formula. C is now going to be equal to 8.85 by 
10 to the power of minus 12 farads per meter times epsilon, which is 8, multiplied by 0 0.314 by 10 to the power of minus 3, and then divided by d. And we're told it's 0 0.25 millimeters, so that's 0 0.25 by 10 to the power of minus 3 meters, okay? So when we multiply all of that out, it works out to be, and I'm, I've just got this here beside me, you can uh, verify this yourself, it works out to be 89 picofarads, okay? So C works out to be 89 picofarads for this particular example. So we have our 2.0 centimeter diameter capacitors separated by 0.25 millimeters and a dielectric constant of 8. We simply plug those into our formula for C that we had in the previous slide and we can work out the capacitance then of the structure is 89 picofarads. And well, actually, I didn't even notice it there, but in small writing at the bottom of the slide, I've got the answer 89 picofarads. Okay. Now, I want to say a little bit about how a capacitor works in a circuit before we have a look at what happens when you combine multiple capacitors together. So the first thing is that a capacitor basically, as I said, consists of these two plates in parallel. And how it works is that when we connect a capacitor to a voltage source, which I'll just draw here represented by a long and a short line. Remember what happens in a voltage source is that basically electrons flow out from the minus side of the battery and they flow around the circuit in this direction, okay? So we have lots of minus charge flowing around the circuit like so. I'm just going to draw an arrow representing the flow of electrons. Remember, however, that the current, we represent current flowing in the opposite direction. So while the electrons flow in this direction, we usually show current flowing the opposite, dire the opposite direction to the flow of electrons. But anyway, what happens over here is that electrons start to build up here on this side of the capacitor. And um, I did mention that the dielectric material doesn't allow electrons to flow through it, but as the electrons start to build up on this side of the capacitor, an equivalent amount of positive charge will start to build up on the other side. So as electrons start to gather on the plates, remember the plates could be rectangular or circular or whatever, an equivalent, equivalent amount of positive charge will build up over on this side here. And what's actually happening is, as the positive charge is building up here, the reason is that as negative charge uh, builds up this side, we know that opposite um, types of charge uh, are attracted to each other. So the positive charge uh, seems to gather on this side. What's actually happening is that the negative charge building up here is repelling the electrons away from the, the, the uh, opposite surface of the, um, capa the capacitor. So it's, it's as if the, the, um, the negative charge is being, is being pushed in this direction here. So as the negative charge builds up here, it pushes away the negative charge up here uh, away from the top plate of the capacitor, and then we have an effective uh, gathering or net positive charge on the side of the um, of the capacitor. And then we basically get an electric field that exists between the both sides of this um, of this uh, capacitor. And um, again, as you can probably imagine, if this gets bigger, if the distance between the two plates gets bigger, the electric field is weaker. Okay? So imagine D starts to increase, then the electric field will actually um, start to decrease and less charge will be able to be um, to be uh, to be stored and then the capacitance will actually um, decrease as well so as d increases we'll have the capacitance will be decreasing okay so more distance means the field is weaker less ability of the capacitor to store electric charge on its plates and the capacitance will go down conversely as d gets closer and closer together as d decreases then the capacitor uh, or the capacitance will, will uh, increase. Okay, so as D gets closer and closer, then there's more electric charge will gather here. The field will be stronger um, due to the plates being closer together. So that's actually part of the reason why, um, why we have D uh, inversely proportional to C in our, in our formula. Uh, another thing to note here is that as the plates get bigger, imagine if uh, this plate here is bigger, then we have more area for electric charge to form on. So again, we have a relationship between A and C because as the area gets bigger, there's more area for um, the charge to gather on 
and therefore we get a larger electric field and the capacitance is related to the amount of energy that can be stored in, 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 the, um, in the field as well. So we have a relationship between area and capacitor, capacitance for a capacitor as well. Larger area, more charge um, stored on both plates and then we get a larger capacitance. So as A increases, C goes up. As A decreases, C goes down. Okay, so there, there are some basic relationships between um, D and C. Now, what you can also imagine is that as you add um, these uh, capacitors in series, that something else kind of happens. And if uh, I'm just going to take the example of um, of two capacitors of exactly the same value to show you what the effect would be. So let's imagine we have um, one capacitor, and I apologize for the crooked lines, and another capacitor uh, connected in series to it. And we have wires basically connecting the two capacitors together. So remember, these plates are made of some kind of metallic or conducting type material. As we add a little connector or conductor in here between these two plates, you can imagine them being pretty much just connected straight together. So if we add two capacitors together like that, and I'll just uh, draw them right beside each other, almost like a sandwich, just for purposes of illustration, um, we now have a larger dielectric existing between the two sides of the plate. So you'll have, some again, some charge gathering up down here, and you'll have some positive charge gathering up here related to the amount of negative charge that builds up here in the bottom. But because the distance between the two plates is now bigger, then this electric field is going to be weaker, and therefore the amount of capacitance will actually, um, the overall amount of capacitance will actually decrease. So going from one capacitor to two, to two capacitor, you essentially have a, a larger distance between the negative charge gathering up on this side and the positive charge gathering up on this side, and therefore the overall capacitance decreases. So the effect of placing capacitors in series is that the overall capacitance will decrease. Um, imagine the converse story where we have capacitors in parallel. Well, we have all of these capacitors connected to, for example, to a voltage source. And the interesting thing about this is that they all charge up at exactly the same time. So here's our capacitors. I'll just try and draw these equal lines to distinguish them from voltage source. Imagine they are all connected to some kind of um, battery um, represented by a plus and a minus for the, the long line and the short line. And then we've got two capacitors, C1 and C2. Now what's happening in this case here is that uh, charge is gathering on both sides of the capacitors at the same time. So we've got some charge basically gathering down here on this capacitor and we have some charge gathering down here on this capacitor. And then similarly, we have positive charge uh, gathering here and here. Now, by the way, I didn't mention it, but there is a limit in terms of the amount of charge that uh, a capacitor can hold. So once a battery is connected and uh, the electrons start to flow, there's a maximum amount of charge that can be held on either side of the capacitor. And this corresponds to the various equations we've seen, like um, W is equal to half um, CV squared. Well, a certain battery can produce a certain amount of, of, um, of energy on a certain capacitor. So it'll, it'll max out after a while, and then if you disconnect the battery, that charge will start to, um, to discharge, for example, to another part of the circuit. But anyway, over here, on this case here, we basically have the batteries charging up two capacitors at the same time, and therefore, because we have a larger amount of charge in total across the two capacitors, we've got the electric field of this, plus the electric field of this, gives you a capacitance here and a capacitance here. We essentially have more energy through uh, two capacitors connected in parallel, and therefore the overall capacitance is yeah, going to increase. So we have a capacitance which corresponds to a certain amount of charge or energy due to C1. We have a capacitance which is due to a certain amount of charge and energy in C2. And overall, the, um, the total capacitance will increase. So again, unlike resistors where putting two resistors in parallel gives you a larger resistance, or putting two, sorry, putting two resistors in series gives you a larger resistance, or putting two resistors in parallel will give you a smaller resistance. In this case here, putting two capacitors in series will give you a smaller capacitance, and putting two capacitors in parallel will give you a larger capacitance, okay? So it's the opposite from what we had with the, um, with the resistor use case. So here it is in equation form, adding capacitors in series. Again, imagining that, um, for example, in, in the case here with these wires, imagine they're just directly connected. You have, as you add more and more capacitors, you have basically a larger, distance between the charge on one side of this combined capacitor and the charge on the other side of this combined capacitor. 
and the overall effect is that the capacitance is going to be reduced. So this is similar to the formula we had for parallel resistors. 1 over C total is 1 over uh, C1 plus 1 over C2 plus 1 and so on over Cn. And again, you can write that as being the reciprocals of the reciprocals. In other words, um, C total is equal to 1 over 1 over C1 plus 1 over C2 plus up to 1 over Cn. Okay, so that's the, the formula for total capacitance. So it's going to be essentially a smaller value than any of the individual capacitors um, that are connected in series. So again, this is the formula for capacitors in parallel. What you can see is that it's similar to the equation for resistors in series. And again, imagine that we connect up a, a battery to these capacitors. So imagine I connect a battery uh, up to here. So we have a long side and a short side representing the positive and the uh, negative side of the battery. Again, what's happening is you've got negative charge basically flowing out from the, uh, the negative side of the battery and it flows up here and up here and so on and you'll have a negative charge gathering on the um, bottom plate here for example in the, in the picture shown of the capacitors and that that will induce a positive charge on the top plate because again remember what's happening is that the negative charge on the bottom is pushing away the negative charge on the top because like forces repel and then that goes back up to the top of the circuit and then that negative charge is actually being attracted back in here to the battery to the positive um, positive side of the battery. So we have basically all of those capacitors charging up in parallel. Remember that there's a relationship between the, the amount of energy um, in a capacitor and its um, capacitance. So we have an energy being created here through these magnetic fields being created on each of the capacitors and overall we have an increase in capacitance. So in fact the total capacitance is going to be C1 plus C2 all the way up to Cn. So that's it for today's video. I hope you enjoyed it and we will see you in the next one. Thanks.